So when you think of a hacker infiltrating a company, trying to get access to your money or your data or your systems, do you think of something like this? Maybe a person at a computer, maybe they're hacking under the cover of darkness, maybe they're just hacking with a hoodie on, right? We have that stock photography image in our mind. Or do we think of something like this? That is me, I'm wearing the exact same outfit so you can recognize me. Do you think of somebody over the phone trying to hack you? Maybe they're trying to gain access to information over the phone. Maybe they're calling to learn a little bit about uh, an email you've received recently and whether or not you should click through that. It turns out that the majority of cyber attacks now start with some type of human element. And on average, these cyber attacks cost companies $11.7 million, right? It's pretty, inten pretty intense. According to research done by the Poneman Institute and Accenture, we now know that a little over than 50% of cyber attacks start with this type of, of human element, over the phone or over email or in person. So when we think of that person who's trying to gain access over the phone, maybe calling to confirm the receipt of an email, that's actually how the majority of cyber attacks start. And as she mentioned, this is how I got my start as well. This is me in the glass booth, absolutely terrified, but of course wearing the same leather jacket because you've got to feel like a badass up there, right? I'm calling a company that has no idea I'm about to hack them. And for the past three years in a row, I've been a winner of the DEF CON social engineering capture the flag. And what we have to do is we have to gain as many pieces of information as possible in 20 minutes in that glass booth in front of about 500 people. They have no idea we're gonna call. So I'm calling people who are in customer support, recruiters, hiring managers, or people who manage events like yourself. These are the types of people that I go after in general when I'm trying to hack a company. And in general, I can get access to a company's systems in a, as little as five minutes. In general, it takes about five minutes or less. So let's walk through exactly how that works today. And keep in mind, I'm not a malicious hacker. I'm not the type that's gone to jail. I do this in a white hat fashion. So I'm doing this to help companies understand where their vulnerabilities are so that they can patch them. But we all know that these types of scams exist, except for I didn't realize that they could do it in person, live in front of an audience like this. We all know that phishing exists. We all know that people call us over the phone. We've all gotten IRS scams. So why is it that they're still successful? Why do people still click? The reason why we still click and we still fall for these things is because social engineering uses an exploit that you can't turn off. Principles of persuasion that are a part of every single one of us and we can't change them. If you're interested in learning more about these types of principles of persuasion, you can read about them in Robert Cialdini's book, Influence. But let's walk through how they look for your company and how I would use them to attack your company. The first one we have is reciprocity. We are way more likely to give information about ourselves when we hear information from another person first. So if you think about it, let's say I come up to you and I'm, I say something along the lines of, what operating system and version do you use? It's very unlikely you're gonna answer that question. Don't answer that question, right? But if instead I'm at my computer and I'm typing away and I'm looking confused and I say something along the lines of, I'm about to go on stage and I can't figure out what to do. My talk link isn't working and I think it might be because I'm on an older Mac. I'm, I'm so bad at computers. I don't know, does anyone know, have any experience with Macs? Right? Now at that point, you're way more likely to offer up information about your computer and your version. It's kind of like that principle of suggestion that we saw on the stage before me, but it's important to realize that these are the types of things that social engineers use to get information out of you. Because 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes down the line, we're not talking about just your operating system and version anymore. Now we're talking about the version of your antivirus software, because I'm gonna get into that really quick. The next one we have is commitment and consistency. We have to make thousands of choices every single day, and we don't make one choice and then the next and then the next. Instead, what we do is we make a choice and then we apply that logic to any choice where it makes sense, right? So we, we, we're trying to be efficient when we make our choices. A social engineer knows that you want to feel rational. You want to commit to your previous decisions. So let's say I call you, 
we're talking, I say from your credit card company, we're having a conversation, and I mention, I have a dog barking in the background, and I'm so sorry, it's kind of embarrassing, I'm working from home today, and I'm not really supposed to have that happen, so if you could just not mention that during the survey, right? And then they're like, oh yeah, it's not a big deal, not a big deal, and I'm like, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, do you have a dog, do you understand what this is like? We've started to build rapport, right? We're starting to commit, and, and we're gonna be consistent in that conversation. Now, 25 minutes later, when I'm helping you process that scam that just went through on your credit card, which isn't true, by the way, I'm calling you to get information about your credit card, you wanna be committed to the conversation because you already decided that you would about 30 minutes ago. And you don't wanna stop 30 minutes into a conversation and think to yourself, I'm sorry, who are you again? Right, because we don't wanna feel irrational. We want to feel like we made the right choice 30 minutes ago embarking on this conversation. But you can stop a conversation at any time. In fact, I hang up on the majority of people who call me. The next one we have is social proof. We trust things that are endorsed by people that we trust. People like large groups of people like yourselves all sitting together. If you all agreed on one thing, I'd be more likely to go along with it too your bosses, your coworkers, people who are high up in your company, we trust them. A social engineer knows that if they name drop those people in a conversation with you, you're way more likely to comply with their request. So if I call you and I say I'm from IT support and I look up on LinkedIn who actually is the highest ranking female member of your IT support team and I call as that person, I spoof that phone number in case you're not familiar with spoofing, I'm making the caller ID look like I'm calling from that person exactly and I say that I'm that person, you're way more likely to go along with it if I name drop a coworker that I just spoke with, right? The spoofing is a part of social proof, and also I'm name dropping, hey, I just talked to Michelle, and she mentioned um, that your computer might be vulnerable as well, so I just wanted to get you set up real quick. It only took like two minutes for her, so it shouldn't take too long, right? Pretty subtle, but then you're thinking, well, I mean, I sit next to Michelle every day. I mean, I'm, I'm working from home right now, but you know, it's one of those things where I'm gonna trust that more likely. The next one we have here is liking. We trust people that we like, and we like people that are similar to us. And we assess this in verbal and nonverbal ways. So as you can see in this picture, they're doing some nonverbal interaction, right? They have the hand signals are very similar to each other. That's pretty obvious. I think we all know that we mimic each other. We all have mirror neurons. But something that I do as a social engineer that's way creepier than this is before I get on, a on an attacking call, I actually look up a video of my target. I find you on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, anything that I can find a sample of you speaking. I'm looking for your cadence, your tone, what phrases you use. I'm looking for you on social media. If you say hashtag blessed every day, I'm saying hashtag blessed, right? I'm one of those people now. That's just the type of thing that I'm looking for because if we're similar to each other, it makes it more likely that you'll comply with my requests. The next one that we have here is authority. This one, again, is pretty obvious. We trust people who are in positions of authority who sound like they know what they're doing. So when I am taking on a persona, we call that pretexting in social engineering, I'm picking the highest person up in the company because you're way more likely to comply with a request from the director of IT than the newest intern. So I'm finding that information on LinkedIn and I'm masquerading as that person. And it's more than just a lie, I take on their entire identity. The next one we have here is scarcity. We trust things that are under a sense of urgency because we don't have time to consider whether or not we should answer that type of question. So if we think about this, um, imagine that I'm calling you and I ask you to go to a link, right? I've done this every year for the social engineering DEF CON capture the flag. I've been able to get people to go to a link in less than three minutes each time. Um, and these could be malicious links, of course, but of course they're not because I'm not a bad person. <laughs> but Imagine if instead I can speed that up. So let's say something like this. Hey, I'm sorry, um, this is kind of awkward. I'm actually sitting on the runway right now uh, and I am, I know this is really awkward, but our plane is about to take off and um, I, I'm just, right way of the sound of the plane taking off. It's going up in the air, I'm playing a YouTube video. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make sure my talk link works before I get there. Um, I know this is really awkward, but if you could just go to www, sorry, if you could just speed up, we're about to take off, I need to make sure it works, www.maliciousurl.com, right? That type of thing is way more likely to work for you because you hear that sound in the background. It adds credibility to my request, right? 
So let's watch an example of a hacker breaking into a cell phone account in two minutes or less, and then we'll talk through the Cialdini principles of persuasion that we see in this video. Looks like our audio isn't working here. To try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm gonna meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're gonna hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you wanna do a sample of phishing call? What's phishing? Phishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you gonna call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh. Oh. I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. So that's pretty terrifying, right? It happens that quickly. Let's walk through what we saw Childani wise in that video. The first one we had was of course social proof. She was spoofing that phone number. And we know that cell phone service providers use our cell phone that we're calling from to authenticate who we are, which is a pretty rough practice since I can spoof a number in about 30 seconds for free online. We also had liking in that video. She was pretty likable, right? She was apologizing a lot. She had the fake, you know, the baby crying in the background. We feel empathetic towards that. She also used the four most powerful words in social engineering. Can you help me? When we use those words, especially towards people whose job it is to help us, it turns something on where they feel compelled to help us, right? They have to open that link. It's their job to download that attachment or you know, fulfill that, that request for a money transfer, right? It's those types of people that we go after because this type of principle works so well on that type of organization. The next one we have was authority, and this one was pretty subtle. If you notice, she said, see, I'm not gonna be able to get a secure pin because I'm on the phone with you right now. That's not true, right? We can get text messages while we're on the phone now in 2018, but she was able to convince somebody about how phones work, and they work at a cell phone providing company, right? But she had so much authority in her voice. She said it with such clarity that they believed her, and she, got, she bypassed that two-factor authentication, right? We also had that sense of urgency. She did something really subtle here again. She created an outside force that was acting upon her, because how could she possibly be the bad guy if she has this other person telling her what to do? If you notice, she said, see, my husband said I had to get this done by today, right? And she's got these kids crying in the background, makes the husband look like a pretty bad guy, right? And we feel for her. And that creates a sense of urgency because we have an outside force acting upon us. The baby crying doesn't hurt either for urgency. 
before we actually get into a booth or get on a phone call or shoot off that phishing email, we do a lot of recon before we actually make that attack. We call this recon OSINT, open source intelligence. And people use high powered tools to do this type of OSINT. Things like Maltigo, if you're familiar with that. In general, I don't need to use high powered tools. I use things like LinkedIn and Instagram. In general, about 60% of the information that I need to hack you or your organization is found on Instagram alone. And the reason why is because of two things. First, geolocation tagging on Instagram, and number two, workstation photos. What I'm looking for when I do an attack is any information, any software, file names, friends, birthdays, events, vendors you use, any information that can have me build a credible, realistic pretext, who I'm pretending to be. And the only way that I can find that information is when you give it to me. And you give it to me by geolo ta geolocation tagging your photos on Instagram. Things that would otherwise be hidden in the background of your hashtag blessed anniversary photo with your balloon, with your computer open in the background, are now completely visible and served up to me in a list on Instagram. And I'm able to scroll through, it does take hundreds of hours, but I scroll through until I know every version, make and model, client lists, ESSID names, passwords, Everything that I need is found in these workstation photos. As you can see here, this is a real workstation photo. I've blocked out a lot of it so you can't tell where this individual works. But we have file names, right, on her computer. If I name drop some of those file names, she's thinking to herself, this person definitely has to be from IT. How else would they be able to see onto my computer, right? Because we don't realize that these things that we post are in the background but that's how I actually attack a company, from these two things alone. So let's walk through the social engineering chain, start to finish, really quickly. First, looking through Instagram, scrolling, 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 we're three hours in, boom, I find it. Your geotagged Instagram computer photo. And I'm looking specifically for your antivirus software because I don't want to create an exploit that doesn't work on your machine. So I need to know your version, and sometimes I can guess it. I see that little yellow shield, if you're familiar, by the clock at the bottom of your computer, and I know you use semantic endpoint protection, and I'm excited about that because what I can see from that shield is it looks like it's an outdated version of semantic endpoint protection. And if it is outdated, of course, there's known vulnerabilities, and I can create an exploit that will definitely work on your machine and will avoid detection. But I need to confirm, I need to know for sure that it is version 4.2. I can't just guess because I will completely waste my time creating an exploit that will not work on your computer or will get me burned. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call as IT support and I'm going to name drop a friend's name and get you to confirm it for me on the phone in less than 30 seconds. So I know, a little awkward to watch somebody act. I'm gonna do some method acting for you right now. <clears throat> Hey, uh, Nicole, this is Alex over at IT Support in New York um, in the headquarters. I'm so sorry to call you um, this late, but uh, I'm really, I'm so sorry. I just kicked you off the network. I was resyncing our servers, and you're going to have trouble logging in tomorrow. Um, so I just actually did this with Nicole uh, a second ago, and it worked really well. So what I need you to do is just, are you, are you on your Lenovo computer right now? Okay, great. If you could just uh, buy your clock there, if you could uh, look for that little yellow symbol. It should be like a little yellow shield. You want to right click on that for me, click about, and does it say 4.2 for your version? Okay, fantastic, awesome. Um, you're good to go, I'm going to reset your, your, your network, you should be good to go tomorrow. If you have any questions, just give me a call back, okay? Well, if she gave me a call back, it's not going to go to me, right? It's going to go to the actual person's number that I was spoofing. But now that I know that she uses version 4.2 for her semantic endpoint protection, I'm going to tailor my malware avoid detection, and it all happened in less than 30 seconds. So that's scary. It's not all doom and gloom. We can do things to make sure that we protect our company and ourselves. So how to defend against this? The most important thing is to remember that everybody in the company, especially client-facing individuals, have to be politely paranoid. And being politely paranoid doesn't mean being rude and hanging up on every single person, though you're welcome to do that. I do it all the time. 
we want to make sure that we verify who people are before we give them information. And information that could be seemingly innocuous, like what version you use of a piece of software, who your vendors are, because if I know that information, I can masquerade as those people and get even more privilege escalation quickly. So these little things turn into big things really, really quick. It's important that we train our client-facing staff, hiring managers, recruiters, customer support, IT, help desk, anybody who is in that type of function are the first people that I go after when I do a vishing phone attack. And we have to make sure those people understand how to use real-world two-factor authentication. This isn't a thing you've probably heard before. People don't really talk about it like this. But it's different than technical two-factor. How this works is if somebody calls you, email them. If they email you, call them. And if they call you, definitely say something like, you know what, I'm jumping into a meeting right now. I can process it for you, but I'll have to give you a call back. That is the scariest thing to a vishing social engineer because, of course, I'm not the one getting the call back. It's going to go to the real person's number, and then I'm completely burned, right? So just doing those little actions, those little real-world two-factor actions can completely protect your organization. And finally, we all know about two-factor, technical two-factor. Things like Duo or YubiKeys are fantastic for protecting your organization because when I run into one of those barriers, it's really difficult for me to get around them. SMS two-factor is a little easier because I can spoof something and send you a text and try and get around it that way. But if you use something like Duo or YubiKeys, a physical token, it's really challenging for me to get around that. So a lot of times people say humans are the weakest link, but I disagree. I think when people understand how to be politely paranoid, humans are your first line of defense. Thank you.